at the end of all of your messages, you append a bunch of your URLs and, and they're all pretty standard. It's like davidbomble.com, YouTube slash David Bomble. And then I noticed that your Discord is like discord.gg slash random characters. And I was like, don't tell me that David hasn't snagged his own Discord URL. What really worries me is, you know, you, how easily you could get good domains, including my Discord, um, how easy it was for you to build this like phishing platform and send emails. It's really worrying uh, how easy it was. Hey everyone, David Bumble back with a very special guest. Corey, welcome. Hi, David, so happy to be here. You gotta tell me, I mean, it's, um, we were talking about this offline. Today's a big day in the US. It's also a big week, if you like, in, in the UK. You gotta tell us about this handle. Why did you get this handle? Well, what is it and and why did you get it? Uh, so Corgi is my handle. Um, I've gone by Corgi for probably like the last 10 years. Um, it's just a play on my normal name, which is Corey with an I, um, just a pen to G in there. And it's such a cute dog as well. It's funny because uh, yeah, with the Queen's Jubilee, it, when I when I was like getting ready, I thought is, is there must is there something that you really like the dog or you like the Queen or it's just something that happened. It's just something that that happened pretty naturally. Corey, before we get into the details, do you have like a Twitter account and other accounts where people can follow you? You know, if they want to learn more and perhaps ask you questions. And I'm, I'm just for everyone who's watching, please don't send her like thousands and thousands of questions. But Corey, where's a good place to follow you or, you know, to interact with you? Yeah, definitely reach out on Twitter. Um, my username is just Korg and then it's underscore the letter E. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions if I can uh, about anything, social engineering or getting into pen testing. And I, I was looking when I was I was trying to get your social media um, profiles ready for this interview. Do you have a LinkedIn or is, it, is Twitter the best place to go? And, and perhaps your website, is, the, is that the best places to go? Twitter is definitely the best place. Or my website, yeah, which is just corgima.com. So I'll put, I'll put those links below. Um, anyone who wants to follow uh, Corey um, and get the details. You do a whole bunch of things. So when I was researching this, you do, and you, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong and, and you know, just tell us the details. You do physical pen testing, you do red teaming, you do social engineering, you do fishing, you do a whole bunch of stuff. So tell us kind of what you get up to and what's, you know, what we're going to be covering today. Exactly. Um, yes. So I'm just an offensive security consultant. So I do everything under that umbrella, the standard like network pen testing, which is like internals, externals, um, and then I do a lot of social engineering for my organization. So that's like the physical pen test and then like vishing, which would be phishing over the phone and then standard phishing, which is through email. And today we're going to do mainly phishing. Is that right? And um, I was, I was going to say, um, be careful which URLs you click on because you did a lot of great preparation for this demo. So tell us what you've been up to and uh, yeah, take it away. Yeah. So um, thinking about this episode, I thought like, what would be a unique approach for David Bombal? Um, so I kind of went out there and at the end of all of your messages, you append a bunch of your URLs and, and they're all pretty standard. It's like davidbombal.com, YouTube slash David Bombal. And then I noticed that your Discord is like discord.gg slash random characters. And I was like, don't tell me that David hasn't snagged his own Discord URL. So I, to shame, yeah. <laughs> I took that for you. So it is in my control right now. I had let your team know beforehand. I was like, he can have it after the show. Well, I really appreciate it. I'm going red now. You know, you've 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 caught me out. No, that's brilliant. So and you and you what did you do with the domain name? Because you also got a domain name, didn't you? I did, yeah. So I it's kind of like a non-standard, it's just David hyphen uh Bomble. But I went ahead and I uh, just downloaded some of the content from your website and it is hosted there right now. I love it. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step back now and let you do a demonstration. Uh, and, and I'll ask a bunch of dumb questions um, like, um, were you hosting it? You know, how much it costs, how you prepare for this? Because obviously you've done a lot of preparation. So I'm really, really impressed. So take it away. Show us, show us what you what you know, lead us down this road. If I wanted to do fishing of a company, how would I do that? Because let's assume that I know nothing. So let's start perhaps with that. Sorry to talk so long. What is fishing? And then... Um, you know, show us how it's actually done. So uh, phishing is kind of like tricking people into an action via email. Usually you'll see like credential phishes. That's the most common type of phish when someone is trying to gain access to a plain text username and password. But then there's also payload phishes, which would have some type of like malicious file attached to it, whether, you know, it's related to 
um, cobalt strike or like any type of payload that someone has made. To start with phishing, when you're targeting an organization, um, usually you'll just want to build like a complete detailed listing of everyone that could work there. And then of course, the email addresses and contact information of those people. For that kind of stuff, there's a tool that I really like. It's called LinkedIn. And that's just linked in with the T at the end. Um, it's hosted up on GitHub. And it allows you to query an organization through LinkedIn and then pull everyone that has a LinkedIn account associated with that organization. And then it even lets you um, play around with the email formats. So like if you think that their email addresses are formatted first name, dot last name, it'll go ahead and make all of those email addresses for you. But obviously when we're phishing, like if I was phishing people who like David Bombal, it would be a little bit different than if I'm phishing like employees of an organization. Um, so for this, I took kind of a different approach. Yeah. So I had went ahead and I went, cause you do a lot of giveaways yeah. and I snagged a bunch of this verbiage that you have. Um, it's all pretty similar. This is also how I saw that you also don't have the David Bumble TikTok. I should have looked into that. Um, oh, that 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 I do. Fortunately. Oh, you do. Okay. <laughs> uh, fortunately, I've got that. So you can't you can't you can't get me there. But there's tons of verbiage here uh, that you could pull. Obviously, you do a lot of giveaways. That would be a really good avenue to approach. It's funny because it, it's interesting that you mentioned that because on YouTube, I have this constant problem, and I, I know a lot of YouTubers have where scammers send people messages in the comments like DM me and you've won a prize. So let me just say that for everyone who's watching this video, please do not reply to the scammers. I will never ask you to DM me on Telegram or something for a prize. But sorry to interject. It's it's interesting that you've taken this route because that happens all the time. People are getting scammed who you know get told they've won prizes. Yeah. Um, and so with your website here, what I had actually done was there's this awesome tool. It's called Single File. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it makes phishing really, really easy because you can just go to any website, and it's a Chrome extension um, and you just click it and it will take all of the content of the website and minimize it into one document. So that'll take like the CSS and the JavaScript and it'll minimize all of it into one thing. So here I've just cloned your entire website. Uh, wow, yeah, just assume I know nothing. So assume <laughs> you just teach us. So that, that's just a tool that you got from the Chrome store, yeah? Yeah, exactly. It's just a Chrome extension. Um, wow. And then the part here, especially, you know, if I was trying to do uh, you can see my own credentials. Um, <laughs> we got you there. <laughs> I will blow that out. <laughs> if, um, you know, you were trying to take this website, with, which is actually what I had done, um, you could just uh, clone that. And then this is actually the site that I have up right now. So it's just David hyphen Bomble, which is completely different, you know, obviously wow. than your domain, but it functions perfectly. And it just, uh, you know, I've removed a couple of things that didn't look I didn't think would look good in a fish clone and it'll just um, capture any credentials submitted into it. It's interesting what you've done because David, I don't want, I'm scared to say anything now because uh, what you've been able to do so far, so quickly, the David Bumble domain is hosted on a different site to the courses, which is what we're seeing here. This is like- um, Teachable. Teachable, right? yeah. yeah. And one of the reasons I'm doing that is because people, I, I'm getting more and more people who are attacking my website and trying to like break in. It's like, no, I'd rather put this on another company. So if, if they have a problem, if we have a problem, it's their problem, not my problem. Yeah. Obviously didn't save me this time. Sorry, go on. And I did notice that, yeah, that it was on Teachable, but it still has your logo. So it looks yep. fancy. So that was really it from that avenue. I also went ahead and snagged that Discord URL of yours um, that was available. I hadn't done anything with it yet, but basically if you just go to discord.gg slash David Bomber right now, it'll go to my uh, Discord. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Until after, yeah, because I will give that to you. That's very. I mean, that that's so cool. I mean, it, I mean, it's it's actually quite bad for me, obviously, being a personal person. But it's um, it's so nice to see you doing this because these kind of things are the same mistakes that companies are going to make. And I'm sure you know, the bigger the company, the more likely they're going to make lots of dumb mistakes. Most definitely, yeah. And then I thought maybe um, a fun kind of like show and tell for this would be uh, configuring a. GoFish server. If you're not familiar okay. with GoFish, it's a type of phishing platform. A lot of red teams use it internally. And I thought we could just create one in Lightsail. It's super easy, uh, quick to do. Yeah, show us. Because I mean, my my thing is, okay, you're going to, you, you've attacked me. So what you've done is you've found domains that are valid 
and then domains that are similar, is that right? Um, exactly. Or domains that shouldn't have should have been registered but weren't registered, like the Discord. Yeah. And then you just register that somewhere on a like Bluehost or some registrar, is that right? Yes. Um, and if I was targeting you, I would probably take either of those, you know, take both of those links because they look so verifiable. And I'd go spam okay. YouTube comments saying like, hey, here's my new giveaway page. <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> Just like we said, what's actually really happening? Yeah, that's really good. Um, I, I on YouTube, I've actually I'm scared to tell you now, but it's um, I've blocked all URLs by default because of the amount of scamming that goes on. But that would, that doesn't stop you. I mean, you can find people's details, can't you? Yeah, of course. Yeah, it, you can go into each individual person. Yeah, it's all about persistence. How much time you really want to spend doing it? And the truth is, like, I don't want to spend a lot of time when I'm working because. I'm only getting paid for a week or two weeks or however long an engagement is. But when people are doing it to support their families, you know, in impoverished countries, they'll spend forever if they have to. So, so just just so that I, sorry, I just want to s- systematically get in my head how it works. So you did some reconnaissance on me. You found some domains. You, you found similar domains that were available and you registered those. And then now, now that you've done that, the next step is to do this. Is that right? Or am I jumping the gun? Well, uh, so I would kind of put these into two different parts because um, okay. I don't think I would email users that follow your YouTube. I would probably just go to your Udemy course and find people who have registered for that or left reviews for it. And I would dig into them, either find their contact information or probably go a more public route, which would be just commenting on YouTube videos. But just to stay true to the... Uh, episode, which is phishing, I thought that we could probably set up a GoFish server, which is just a phishing platform and show people how they could send out phishing emails in mass. So GoFish, just for everyone, I, w- I want to bring the level down. That's a platform that allows you to create a phishing campaign. Is that right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, so GoFish is a phishing platform and I'll do a run through of it too, because I love Okay, GoFish. Sorry, go on, go on. Yeah. So I will... Go ahead and just start up a light sale instance. I'll do it. What is a light sale instance? Um, so within Amazon Web Services, it's just like a virtual private server. Um, people can do like EC2 or light sale. I prefer light sale. And those are the kind of costs up there that it costs for like a month or something, yeah? So basically, you're just setting up a virtual server in the cloud for some amount of dollars so that you can set this up, yeah? Exactly, yeah. And this one is free for the first three months. Um, okay. Even worse. <laughs> Yeah, I won't even use it for that long. It's just amazing how the tools are so readily available if you know where to go. So I appreciate you, you know, sharing this. Of course. And um, this will take a minute to load, but all the GoFish documentation is on GitHub and then on their website as well. It's a really amazing phishing platform. It lets you do so many things and man- maintain so many different campaigns within it. So my virtual private server is loading up right now. Um, I will give that a minute. This is the documentation. Uh, within GitHub, it's super readable, um, even for like non-technical people. Um, for the downloads, we'll utilize that in a second whenever this loads up. So you're spinning up a server, and then you're going to do like a Git clone or something. Uh, exactly. Something like that, right? yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, w get it. Um, this download, and then we'll work from there. Uh, you'll see. It's literally like a ten-step process. It's unbelievably easy to set this up. Just for someone who wants to start out, the um... The first thing you did, you got to find information about some like a company. We've all got these like dodgy emails. So will you also show us how to like write an email so that it looks legitimate? Is, is that part of this um, go fish thing? We can definitely do that. Yeah. I will show you how to configure everything within this if you'd like. This is our virtual private server. Um, I've got to ask the question, how did you learn this stuff? Did you, um, sorry to take on a tangent, it's just always interesting. Did you just pick this up through years of like experience or are there any resources that you found really valuable, books, stuff like that? Um, so I've always been super into technology. My dad was a programmer when I was growing up. He was like a Perl monk. Wow. So he was always securing stuff. And I was always like, I have to break it to get past my dad. Um, so I've always been super aware of security and hacking. That was just something I like grew up loving. Um, but in terms of just really doing hands-on stuff is the best way to learn. Um, there are really great resources too for like generic pen testing. I always recommend the Hacker Playbook. It's one of my favorite series of books. It's absolutely incredible. So we're in here, uh, just do a pseudo so that we have root privileges. And I'll go ahead and just make a directory called GoFish. So everything's super organized. I like to be very organized within my machines. 
That's great. We'll, we'll go into that and then we're just going to do a wget. So we'll pull this Linux download. Perfect. All right. So we want to go ahead and grab that. We'll make sure that it's there. Uh, we're going to have to do, because this is a fresh VPS, we're going to have to apt install unzip so that we can unzip that. And we'll unzip our GoFish. Make sure that it's all there. Perfect. And then, so this is the really big part um, when you're configuring a GoFish server, this config.json, um, that file stores all of your configurations. So okay. we are going to have to just make a small adjustment here. So this admin server listen URL, right now it's set at localhost and then at the port 3333. Um, to make this externally accessible, you have to actually change that to 0.0.0. .0, .0 dot, uh, port 3333. Could you use port 443 or 80? Oh, yeah. or is, you yeah, can, just you, change it to whatever port, yeah? Yeah, this is just like the standard uh, GoFish configuration. I usually leave it at that uh, just because it's okay. what I'm used to. But you totally can. You can change that. So we have that set up. And then we're going to go back within our VPS. And Amazon has some weird, like, I shouldn't say weird. They're very strict about their, like, networking rules. Yep. So we are going to have to add a custom rule here to allow our port. And we have that configured. So back in here, and all we have to do now is just start GoFish. Yeah, configuration issue. So I'm glad when you make mistakes because it's um, you know, it helps us learn. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I love when I see people make mistakes in like online tutorials. So yeah, we're changing our permissions uh, for GoFish. So we're going to switch mod. And now we should be able to start it. Awesome. And so whenever you spin up a GoFish server, it will host, whenever you spin it up for the first time, it will host the username and password for the administrator within the starting um, message. So we'll go ahead and find it here. Awesome. So we've opened it up to the internet. So we'll just take our VPS's address. We'll go there and then we'll append our 3333. Three, three, three. And here wow. we go. Just like that, eh? Yes. Wow. So we'll go ahead and log in with those credentials that we made. And I love GoFish. It's such an amazing platform. It has so many characteristics to it for phishing. Um, and it'll prompt you to reset a password whenever you first create a server. Let me guess it's Corgi. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, bad. Don't joke. say that on the air. <laughs> so, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, so this is GoFish. So this is um, just the standard dashboard. So once you start to create uh, phishing campaigns within GoFish, they'll all show up here um, along with some really fun stats on like the number of users that clicked it, the number of users that reported an email, the number of users that submitted credentials, et cetera. So this is where you store campaigns. So this would be anything active that you have running, any active like phishing campaigns. Users and groups, this is awesome um, where you submit any users that you're forwarding a phishing campaign to. So if you're targeting an organization, you could use a tool like LinkedIn uh, to pull all of the employees that are listed as working at that company on LinkedIn. And then you can actually just put them in a CSV. LinkedIn makes them into a CSV and you can just bulk import that here. So you can target like a thousand people within seconds. Um, email time. How long does it take you to, you know, from the technical part, is it, it's taking you a few minutes. That's all it's done. It's taking you, right? Exactly. Yeah. And most of the time people will have, you know, standard phishing platform servers that they maintain internally. So they don't even have to do this every single time. Um, it's worrying, isn't it? It's worrying. It is. Um, it's scary. Although I feel like I don't get very many uh, phishing emails and I've seen my organization's internal um, like phishing attacks, like the real phishing attacks that we've re received from threat actors. And it doesn't seem like it's as much as I would have thought it would be. Do you think that's because people are more aware or do you think that's because the um, like the spam filter stuff like that is picking it up? Well, and I've seen on the other side of the spam filter too. I think that probably most people that conduct phishing attacks like this 
are probably like sole actors or they work in like those warehouses, you know, in another, in an impoverished country where they're just trying to make money less as much APTs, you know, or people who are trying to mass steal credentials. So this is where you would create email templates. So those actual phishing emails that you forward to people, you can store hundreds of them within here. Um, Landing pages, which would be the actual website. So like the davidbomble.com that I had made. And then sending profiles. So this is where you store all of your personal domains. You can host tons of domains in here so that you can cycle through tons of different phishing emails. And that is really it in terms of their configurations. If you want me to walk through any of them or we could like build out a phishing email or something. It'd be great if you can show us like A to Z, if you like. How, okay, so you've got this installed now. How did you get my website or like, um, how, what do I do now? So I'm looking at this application. What do I do now? So we could go ahead and create an email template. Um, okay. This is how you create an email. The naming convention is just for your own use. So that would never be seen by a user. Here, I'll just say David Bombles. And my email subject will be, let's see, you're at like 900 Dave, Dave. something thousand say, Dave. subscribers. Sorry, go on. Right? Am, yeah. Yeah. One million. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Subscriber giveaway. Give away. <laughs> well done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can see you do this for a living. <laughs> wow. And I already stole some text that you had up on your website. You did good. We'll use the wow. Udemy one when you had 500,000 students on Udemy. So I'm not, for everyone watching, I'm not doing a giveaway. <laughs> oh, One million. It's Yet. Corey's fault. No giveaway. <laughs> um. <laughs> Okay, so this is the exact wording that you had posted when you ha- hit half a million students on Udemy. So we can just yep. update this so it looks exactly like you would say it. Uh, and I'm using Discord, even worse. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you got me. So, so that's where you could use like my proper Discord or the, the one that you registered. Oh, exactly, yeah. Wow. And that is the only social that I would link here. Awesome. And then you also use these, I noticed this too. For links, you always use the bit lie, which- I've changed that, fortunately. <laughs> oh, yes. you have changed it? <laughs> yes. Okay. I've got wise. Yeah. Um, I was going to use that as well. No, that's fine. I mean, let's just, yeah, because people would people would recognize that, wouldn't they? And they'd probably click on it. So yeah, feel free to use one of those. Yeah, I use a I use a another David Bumble domain, but that's the problem. It's like a David Bumble wiki domain. So you could have registered david bombblecom which you've registered, and you could do something else there. Are you ready? Yeah, you already done it. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So we can go ahead and our make our. Bill. I will also steal this because it looks pretty good. Um, CCNI, CCNP. I'm glad you're working on the right on the right side of the law. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, we could just steal these links. Um, perfect. Yeah. So this is just how we would craft an email. Um, oh, I didn't even take that bit live. We could just leave it like this. Um, yeah, I mean, it proves the point. Yeah, exactly. So save that template. Um, so this is what we have here. The landing page, I would just actually forward to my, so I'd redirect this to the website that I actually own because yeah. for landing pages, yeah. this would just be hosting dynamic content when I already have the static website that I purchased. And then we would just integrate users in groups. So if I was um, targeting people that watch David Bommel, I would go to your YouTube page and look through everyone who has either left a comment on your videos or I'd go to your Udemy and see the people who have left reviews for it. And target those people likely. How would you get the email addresses? Are you know, like uh, social engineer them to give you an email address. Is that right? Well, yeah. Um, if I had enough time to dig, I would just identify those actual users. You know, identify people that have a name or some sort of information associated with their account, and then just kind of backwards trace that. Use open source wow. intelligence to identify that. And if it was a, let's say it was a corporate rather than my subscribers, you would just find the emails on LinkedIn and places like that. Is that right? Exactly. So let's say I'll give you an email address. Can the editors please beep it out? So it's just. Yes. Do you want this to be sent to your email? Yeah, let's send it. And okay. then I'll, I'll, I'll put it on screen. I um, will have to send it to you afterwards because I don't have, I would need to associate my DNS a record with this. So okay. 
Uh, so, so you, in other words, okay, so that's good that you've said that. So if I'm using this tool, mm -hmm. I've got to do something here to to send the email, is that right? Yes. Yeah, so you'll need to add an A record to whatever domain you're using for the sending profile. So if you want it to be at like my davidbomble.com, if you want it to be david at davidbomble.com, you can easily do that. You just need to associate the DNS records with this GoFish server that you've created. Okay. So if you did send it now, it would just come from some random email address, is that right? Or it wouldn't send it. It would not send. Okay. So do where do we set that up? Where do we set up that piece? Is it something that you have to do here or is it something that you have to do on a on like your um your provider? I would have to go through my provider, the person that I okay. purchased the domain name from. Because I want to keep the level low and just make sure that we understand the steps. This server needs to be configured with SMTP or something, is that right? To forward that email. Um and you need to have the right details. Is is that correct? Or exactly. Yeah. Okay. So in this app, is there a place where you have to set that or is it just, um, I'm just trying to in my head, how do I connect this to the, um, oh, is it on the sending profile? Yes, okay, there we go. exactly. So there's so, the, okay, sorry. Yeah, those okay. are the sending profiles that you um, associate the email with. So, okay, so it's the SMTP. Okay, I get it. Yeah, okay, yes. that makes sense. So you give it You give it a name like David, the boomer, easy to hack guy, <laughs> um, SMTP from David, the boomer, and then the host is the actual SMTP server. Okay, great. That makes sense. Exactly. Wow. It's way too easy. It is. I'm trying okay, to think. Okay, so I, I get the email. So I click on the link, um, which I won't do because I'm scared of you. But let's say I did click on the link. That would take me to the server that you've got, the phishing server. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. And um, you could take any approach like a payload fish where you're prompting users to download something. That seems like a really good option if someone was targeting your users. Because yeah. what would I do with their credentials besides like their Google credentials or something, which could be linked to a lot of different things. But yeah, more likely just establishing a connection to their device would be best. So you're going to try and get them to download something onto their computer. Yeah. So let's make it corporate now. So this is in a corporate environment. What are you going to try and get them to do? Um, so it depends. We take both approaches um, at the corporate level, both credential fishes, uh, which would allow us to access their internal network um, unless they have MFA. But of course, there are ways around that or a uh, payload fish where, you know, we're just trying to establish access to their actual device. So you're basically going to get something to install so we can, you can get a backdoor into their computer. Is that is that the payload idea here? Yeah? Yes, exactly. And then the credential is where you get them to log into a real site, which is obviously your fake site. And then you grab their credentials and then you could use that to get access to their company. Is that correct? Exactly. And some, something that I like doing a lot, um, I really like forming chained social engineering attacks. So that'll be like we send out an original fish email and then we pull the, the um, submission rates off of that. Um, but then we go ahead and we attach another form of social engineering attack. So something that I frequently do is if I don't get a lot of submissions or a lot of success with the phishing, like through the email, I will go ahead and call each one of those users that I had sent the phishing email to. And um, I'll try it from that way. So a frequent pretext that I use in that situation is, hey, you know, I'm Corey with IT and um, I sent you this email the other day. I haven't heard a response back yet and we can't close wow. the ticket until you do this. And it's, it is incredibly effective. People are way too trusting. Is that right? They are. And I think it's kind of necessary, you know, otherwise we yep. would all be paranoid. Yeah. 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 It's a, it's interesting. Different parts of the world I find are more trusting than others. It, I agree with you. You have to have some kind of level of trust. Otherwise, you know, you can't function. Yeah, definitely. Corey, do you have like an example of a real campaign that you've run or something? Because this is like blank and it's nice to see it from scratch, but can you give us like an idea of what it would actually look like in reality? Yes, definitely. Um, so when you go into the campaigns, once it's completed, you'll see all these sorts of statistics on um, how many users have submitted credentials or how many users have clicked the links, even how many users have opened an email, um, which is very helpful sometimes to ensure that emails have passed like spam filters. So on the email templates, you've you've crafted a great one for me. Have you got any examples that you can show us of like real phishing um, templates that have worked? And obviously we'll hide the company information. Yes, I can. Um, I can pull something up. I can show you one that's super, super effective. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for one second. Awesome. So this is a super effective, um, this is one of my favorite fishes. Um, of course, when we're targeting people, um, the things that we aim for are getting emotion out of them because 
That's what gets people involved. So this is one of my favorites. It's like co-branded company swag. So the entire email targets that this organization has created a new wearable for their employees and everyone gets an option, whether it be a shirt, a like quarter zip up pool, a blanket or a water bottle. For each of these, I Photoshop like the organization's logo onto that item. And then the image goes out with that. So it just adds like a really nice touch. I've never had this not work. Um, And frequently, this is the most uh, popular fish that I use. It'll get anywhere between like a 40 to 60% submission rate, which is pretty non-standard. Yeah. So just for everyone who's watching, I'm not going to do send you an email with swag. (laughs) There's no no David Bombal swag coming on an email because you know it's coming from Corey, not from me. (laughs) That's brilliant. Wow. Did you say 40 to 60% click through? 40 to 60% submission wow. rate. So those are actual credentials. But this is the most, things like this are super common for uh, credential fishes when you're trying to obtain a username and password repair. When you move into like payload fishes, something I'll frequently do is based off of security tooling. So coming from the perspective of IT, like, hey, you know, our antivirus or our endpoint detection response tooling has not been updated on your system. It needs to be updated immediately because of whatever security concerns are happening. Please go ahead and download this. That pretext itself is very successful as well. So now the the big question, I get a lot of flack because I I talk about, we talk, I do these red teaming interviews and these like hacking interviews. And then all the blue team guys are like, David, what about stopping this nonsense? So what's your advice? How do you, how do people on the good side stop this? Because you're doing this penetration testing to, to help a company improve their their security. So what what advice would you give them if like someone, like 40% of people, you know, give you their credentials? What advice, what's the next step? So what do you what do you advise the company? For the organization to do? Yeah. So like now you've proven that you can you can get through their security defenses and a lot of people are falling for this. What do you what do you do you just give them the report and say, you're in trouble now, or do you like say, okay, well, this is what I suggest you teach you. Do they go for training? What do you, what do you, what, what's the next step? Yeah, of course. We always work with organizations through mitigations and remediations past this stuff. For organizations that are susceptible to phishing, obviously multi-factor authentication on everything is our first suggestion because really you can phish a user and if the, if that single set of credentials isn't helpful, you can't move any further, right? Because you, there are plenty of instances that we see where you can get a username password repair and you can't access anything because they have like fully uh, protected all of their authentication points. So yeah, so the, the the best deterrent or the best thing to do as a minimum is is, is two-factor authentication, is that right? Yes, and we also see that done poorly. Just yeah. recently with, I can't remember... It was like a group of 16-year-old kids that had gone into Microsoft. I forget the name of yeah. their group. But they had done something called MFA bombing, which is... Um, so we see MFA implemented poorly as well, like when users get a text message and it says, click this text message or click this push notification to allow access to your system. And if someone is already on their computer, they'll think, you know, that's for me. Or if it happens at 3 a.m. 100 times in succession then of course, you know, they want to stop receiving that notification. So implementing MFA and then implementing it appropriately to Google's MFA is one of the best implementations that I've ever seen. If you try attempt to log into a Google account, it'll tell you, go into this specific app on your trusted yeah. device and then enter the code that you see on that on this computer. So there is no way getting out of that other than like social engineering, maybe calling a user, which, you know, it, is a great deterrent. Any other advice? Because I think that's, I'm glad you used the Google example because I, I find that it's, it, you know, the problem is it's frustrating and then people turn it off or try and circumvent it because, you know, I might not have the device with me or I'm traveling and all this kind of stuff. Um, what's your advice to organizations to convince the users to do this? Just forcing them. Um, I feel like, <laughs> I like that's <laughs> the only response, especially internally, because you know, being an employee, you kind of you do have a responsibility to help secure your organization. And if that means it will take you an additional thirty seconds to log in, then unfortunately, that's just the pathway that has to happen. So, have you got any war stories? I mean, obviously, don't tell us names, but have you got like any crazy war stories of things that you've done? I I do have war stories, um, more so on the physical pen testing side, because you know when you're sitting behind a keyboard doing 
fishing, it's not as exciting. So I think we need to get you back for physical pen testing. I don't know if it, that's very hard to demo, but um, hopefully you can do some, give us some B-roll for, for another video. But give us some examples just to, you know, to, to whet the appetite. What, give us some crazy examples of physical pen testing that you've done. Yes. So physical ten, pen testing, the only time that I was ever caught, I would say, um, I was working for uh, an organization that was, it was a super, super secure industry. So I had identified an employee that was working at a location I was trying to access through LinkedIn. And I saw that he had only been working there for like six months or so. So I thought he probably doesn't have a great idea of the practices that they use in terms of letting visitors come in. And I spoofed their director of physical security's phone number. And I called him. I called his personal cell phone that I had found um, just through open source intelligence. I spoofed her phone number and I was like, hey, this is me, the director of physical security. And I have a vendor that's performing a physical access control review within half an hour. Um, She's going to come on site. Can you please let her in? He was like, of course, I'll let her in. So then this was actually across the country from where I live. So I had just flown into there that morning. And then I called him. I got on site. He let me in and he was like, you can go anywhere you want besides the server room. And of course, you know, being a physical pen tester, that is really the only place that I want to go. I don't care about your bathroom or whatever. From the perspective of an auditor, I was saying, you know, I really need to access the server room. That's the final part of this process. And so he let me in there, did what I do. And then as I was walking out, two people came up to me and they were swearing. They were like, who is this person? How, why did you let them in here? And he was like, don't worry, it's not a breach. That was when I cut it uh, because they were just so upset, so visibly upset. I was like, you know, I finished my review. I'm going to go ahead and head out of here. Thank you so much for all of your help. And then as I was leaving, their CISO had called me and he was like, Please tell me that that was you, Glory. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. So, I mean, they, they obviously paid you to do the test and yeah. they were obviously very relieved that it was you at the end of the day. Yeah, definitely. No, uh, that was it. So that was a close call. And actually, they said that that was the first breach that they had ever had at that location, even in terms of physical pen testing. So. And the poor guy lost his job. Um, I'm not just kidding. I don't know. Hopefully it was all right. <laughs> I hope so. Tell me, you. I saw in another interview, you um, you have this excuse that you use that gets you past a lot of people's security. Um, you say you're an auditor. You kind of use that term again in this example. Could you just tell us like that? Well, what, I can't remember exactly what term you use and, and how it helps you. Yes. So I do use the auditor pretext a lot when I do physical pen testing because everyone is familiar with auditors and they're so frequent. They happen on a recurring basis. And people feel really out of the loop when it comes to an annual audit. So being an auditor, surprised at someone's door, you know, across the country, it it helps all the time. Um, It's a pretext that I don't think has ever failed with me, at least. That's amazing. So, I mean, you don't, do you have to break through doors and do, I've seen a lot of like physical penetration testing where people do all kinds of like crazy things. Do you, do you find that social engineering is the way that you get in or do you have to also like go through doors and, and do interesting things? So there are times that I need to do stuff like that. I always try to go the social engineering route just because it's easier. It's easier on everyone. It doesn't damage your locks, you know, and it's easy for me to lie to people. Um, and this is actually a funny instance. I actually had someone once say, went into the front of this organization. I was like, hey, I'm an auditor. I'm doing a physical access control review. I need to take pictures of all your cameras and stuff. And um, someone, an employee from that organization had come out and he was like, this is so funny. The last time someone checked our uh, physical security controls, they broke in through the stairwell. And I was like, oh, don't worry. (laughs) That won't be me. You know what the thing is? It's nice to talk to someone like yourself who's doing this. Because, you know, the movies display it as like James Bond doing crazy things and you saying that's not necess- always necessary. Social engineering is, is, is a lot easier. Exactly. It, it really is. And yeah, just putting the work into um, forming pretext is super beneficial. One of my favorite pretexts that I've ever had was um, I had dug into this organization, um, their background and all of the employees at it. I identified that the CTO... Um, had a daughter who had just went off to college a few years ago. And so when I woke up in the morning, um, I grabbed some muffins from my hotel cafe. I went over to the office and I was like, hey, 
I'm so-and-so's daughter. I'm in town from college and I really want to surprise him. And they were like, oh, this is awesome. Like, I'm so glad to be involved in this. Go in. The, the, the thing is how, always in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, how do you learn this stuff and how do you stop this? Um, you've given us... Um, you're giving us some books. Have you have you got any other resources or is it just practice? Yes, um, a lot of practice. I also think some people, I hate to say this, but I think that some people are just better adapted to like social engineering naturally, whether they can read people in an instance, because I work with a lot of technical people, obviously, when I do, you know, I do often yeah. security and a lot of them do not make great social engineers um, and they try exactly. and try. But yeah, sometimes it can be painful to watch them. Something really fun that we're doing um, is we have the social engineering community, which is a new village at DEF CON this year. And so we have a vision contest where people can submit an entry to that and they'll actually go up on stage in our sound booth and they'll make real vision calls to these various organizations and they'll collect like flags. It'll be super fun. That's great. I mean, I it's fun. Did I hear a baby in the background there? Yes, you did. No, that that that, that just, as soon as I heard that, it reminded me of there's this YouTube video where a where a lady was also doing a, a social engineering, and she she just played baby sounds to get people to to feel pressure to do something, like um, give them personal details. Sorry, go on. Yeah, I think that that video is act. I think that's Rachel Rachel Toback. She's in the village too. I love her so much. She is incredible at what she does. She was one of my first like role models in social engineering. She is just incredible. So social engineering, obviously you got to have like, um, a, naturally you have a skill for it. I, I mean, whenever I have these conversations, I think of my wife, She, she's going to be a million times better than me because she can just read people. Um, I tend to be much worse at that. She can just look at someone and read what's going on. And I think when when I heard you getting interviewed in uh, before, you were saying that reading, and you said, no, you need to be able to read people and then adjust to the situation. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. And it can be within seconds because not everything is overt as people coming up to you and swearing. It yeah. can be on the back end while you're doing things, whether it be calling the police or you know being suspicious of you. And you have to identify when it's time to move on. So Corey, just for me, because I'm 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 a bit slow. What you did is you you found domain names, so like davidbommel.com, and then you registered a a similar domain, and that's where you were gonna host the 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 the, the fake website where I would put my credentials in. Then you downloaded the software, the GoFish software. You or well, sorry, you firstly registered and you, you got a VPS on Amazon. Then you 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 copied that software down and that that gave you the ability to actually send the email. Um, and the email is the way that the person would go to the fake website, and then they would log in with those, with their real real credentials, hopefully, and then you would grab those credentials. Is, is, did I did I understand that correctly? Exactly. Yeah. Before we wrap up, do you have any final words or advice for anyone who wants to get into this, or advice for people who are trying to stop this nonsense? So. For anyone trying to get into social engineering, if you're going to be at DEF CON this year or any other year, come check out the social engineering uh, community, which is the new social engineering village that we have set up. Um, it's going to be awesome. You can go ahead and make calls within our sound booth, You know, try your hand at fishing, see whether you like it or not, and really just get out there. There's some great books out there on social engineering. There's some really great people to follow. Uh, Rachel Toback is amazing. Snow um, over at IBM. Is also awesome. So just remind us, what are your socials? I think it was your Twitter account that's the best place, is that right? Yes. Uh, feel free if anyone wants to reach out to me on Twitter. It's just Korg, C-O-R-G underscore the letter E. Thanks so much for doing the demo. I know demos can be really hard. And, um, you know, it's sometimes it, it's easier to talk about this stuff than to demo it. What really worries me is, you know, you, how easily you could get good domains, including my Discord, um, how easy it was for you to build this like phishing platform and send emails. It's really worrying uh, how easy it was. But I uh, thanks so much for demoing that because, you know, it, it's one thing to talk about it and it's a different thing to, you know, see it in practice. So really appreciate you spending the time. Yeah, thank you so much, David.